climate and energy are complicated, nuanced subjects. And none of that comes through in the popular discussion. I teach at NYU in the fall, of course, on climate science, and in the spring, of course, on energy. And those students at the master's level come away with their eyes opened up about just how complicated and difficult these issues are. Okay. Uh, you, uh, in the uh, book with a couple of chapters, Who Broke the Science and How to Fix the Science? Uh, I guess we've already been talking a little bit about who broke the science, but I wouldn't mind hearing you elaborate on that. And I'm especially concerned about how you think uh, you can fix the science given the political, uh, you know, winds that are blowing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, what I have seen is the the scientific institutions. I think the National Academies, which in many respects does a great job on other areas, have fallen down on this one. Uh, the administration's office on science technology policy, uh, the professional societies uh, have all in some ways jumped on the bandwagon and have been suppressing the um, uncertainties in the science, uh, the fact that not much is happening with extreme weather, um, the difficulties in making a transition to a low emission. Um, and you know, there are many people, and it's not just me or the course, small group of friends, I think there are many people who realize this, just don't want to speak out. How to fix it? I think in some ways the science, the situation is going to fix itself, not without some pain. As the measures that are being proposed to reduce emissions, the banning of internal combustion engines, uh, after 2035, that's happening in many states. Uh, the push to deploy lots of solar and wind and shut down natural gas and uh, nuclear happening in California, happening in the Northeast, where you are. That's going to degrade the reliability and affordability of uh, the energy system. You know, the, the Energy providers in the Northeast got really worried in Christmas a, a week or two ago, uh, where you are, because they couldn't get enough natural gas, because pipelines had been um, uh, canceled, so to speak. Um, so that's going to start to affect ordinary people. And I think eventually they're going to start to ask the question, tell me again why we're doing this. Uh, and that is going to lead to some kind of reexamination of the science. You know, I can fantasize that there should be a truth and reconciliation uh, kind of exercise, perhaps sponsored by Congress, about who knew what when uh, and who misrepresented what when, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, reality will eventually force uh, um, a reckoning uh, in what we do about all of this. Well, uh, it takes us a little bit off topic, but I can't help but think about the Great Barrington uh, resolution and uh, the reaction to uh, the the COVID pandemic um, and the discrediting, I think it's fair to say, of many sources of scientific authority in, in retrospect now that we can see that, you know, maybe focus protection was shouldn't have been dismissed out of hand. Maybe herd immunity wasn't a bad word and things of this kind. You see parallels there? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, it's even worse in some ways. As we were working our way through COVID, there were a lot of scientific uncertainties, uh, particularly early on, and we started to understand more and more. Um, uh, but you couldn't say that one thing was more right than another at the beginning. Uh, it's just that you should have given credence to some of these alternative views, uh, which was not done, as you point out. I think here in the climate, we actually have a lot of data, we have some understanding, and it is the um, full understanding that is being suppressed. Um, you know, I, again, just to refer to my own particular case, um, as I told you, we've sold a lot of copies of books. Not a word in the New York Times, New York Times bestseller list, Washington Post, nah, all right? Um, 
very rare to get a uh, debate going on the science. I've been fortunate to be able to do a few over the last couple of months. Um, but, you know, the fact that you can, I can just publish the data, not my data, but the official data, and say, hey, this does not accord with what you're being told. The fact that I can only publish that in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which is a fine paper but has a limited readership, uh, you know, suggests that there's a lot that people are not being told. Well, I don't understand why the National Academy of Sciences, of which you are a member, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, I am not, but I have served on committees from time to time, of uh, wouldn't impanel uh, a high-level expert committee to overview the entire corpus of scientific work on this very important public issue and issue a definitive report or set of reports that basically replicate the arguments that you're making and unsettled or other arguments if those were the ones that the evidence supported. But in any case, why wouldn't the NAS speak to this in an authoritative way? Well, you know, what you get out of the panel depends upon who you put on the panel. Uh, I had a friend once who was not a, I have a friend who's not a climate scientist, but a very good engineer. And he was on one of these committees. Uh, and he describes the experience of walking in the first meeting of the committee saying, and the discussion was, well, we know what we're going to write. How can we write this? Uh, um, okay. Um, I, the selection of the panel, um, the modulation of the language, the difference between the summary and the content. Um, you know, a lot of these assessment reports depend upon adjectives, adverbs, um, to give a flavor to the non-expert, and you can yeah. spin it one way or the other. A lot of what's in my book, well, almost all of it is out of the official reports or the literature or the data. Um, and I think one of the powerful things in the book is exposing the disconnect between what the non-expert description is and what's actually going on with the science. Now, what about the Paris Accords, or the possibility of international diplomacy, uh, being able to get the Chinese and the Indians and uh, the Europeans and the North Americans all on the same page on this? I mean, particularly in light of what you just observed about the fact that uh, most of humanity has yet to fully uh, empower itself to enjoy the benefits of of the modern technological civilization that we take for granted, which depends on fossil fuels. Ain't going to happen, all right? We're not going to reduce. <laughs> We're not going to go to zero, certainly by 2050. Even John Kerry admits that now. Uh, and we're not going to go to zero globally, certainly before the end of this century. Um, the demand... Oh, excuse energy, me. Can you just explain to people what go to zero I, I see, means? Okay. So the world emits a certain amount of greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, every year. Most of that emission is due to the burning of fossil fuel. Because the world is developing and the population is increasing, the amount of fossil fuels we burn every year goes up, has been going up at about 1.5% a year. In order to stabilize, not reduce, but just stabilize human influences on the climate, those emissions have to go to zero. If you want to stabilize the climate allegedly, at one and a half degree temperature rise, it goes to it needs to go to zero by 2050. Um, if you go to zero more slowly, um, the temperature will be higher. They say. Um, so the goal, political goal, uh, goal of the Paris Accord, is to get to uh, zero sometime in the latter half of this century globally. That means. No emissions of fossil fuels and use the conventional way. Also, by the way, you've got to fix agriculture, which accounts for about 25% of emissions. But basically, to get to an emissions-free world by 2050 uh, or 2100. So that's kind of the goal. But if you look at the drivers, the development, the rate of change of technology, the somewhat modest increase in population expected over the next 80 years, um, there's just no way that's going to happen. And you can understand that 
from the point of view of the Chinese or the Indian, their overwhelming priority is to get enough energy for their people so that they can improve their lot. Um, the, the issue of, well, something might happen to the climate 100 years from now um, is just not particularly important relative to that overwhelming need. It's like